Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the God. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Burner. What's My up, guy. brother? What up, brother? How's it going? I'm feeling great. Now, how are you doing first and foremost? I'm doing good, man. Mind over matter. Okay. Now, for people that don't know, we reported this a couple of months ago about Berna, uh having cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, your, your fight with cancer. And are you cancer-free now? Yeah and no. Okay. So they removed um, about a foot and a half from the colon, and they removed some lymph nodes around it. And uh, I thought it was in the clear. I thought it was good. And they said everything. They did a biopsy. Everything came back negative for cancer. But because it was a late stage two, almost a stage three, and they said they did some, like, research on the blood floating around. They might feel like it might try to find another home. So they're recommending right when I get back to the to the West Coast chemo for, like, three to six months, which is, like, a my biggest nightmare. But I feel like, man, I'm so blessed to have found it. Right. And uh, I wanted to sh- share some game with you guys. Yeah, well, first of all, what type of cancer was it? It's colon, colon cancer. Colon cancer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the crazy thing is um, one in three people will be diagnosed with cancer in their life, mm-hmm. right? And uh, 71% of the people getting the cancer or getting cancers are not commonly screened. Like colon cancer, I'm 38. You know what I mean? So there's a company out there called Grail that does this test, and I want everyone to, that's watching this if you guys got cancer in your family history. They have a test called Gallery, and it detected my colon cancer through a blood test, and they screen for 50 other types of cancer. So, you know, majority of the people dying from cancer are Latin Americans, African Americans. It's important for us to like stay vigilant on our bodies. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And you have a family history of yeah. cancer as well. So I know for you was th- that was something that you were actually just going to get tested because of your family history, or was it a standard? I didn't even go to get tested for cancer. I, I hired a uh, personal doctor really randomly. Shout to Doctor J. Hired him out of nowhere. I just thought, shit, I'm successful. I should have someone really looking after me, right? Within a week of hiring him, I went there to go get my antibodies test. I started doing indoor shows again. So I want to make sure that the vaccine was doing its job on my body. He said, hey, I'm the only doctor in the country that administers this test that screens for cancer. You want to take it? I said, hell yeah, I want to take it. And where's this doctor located? In California? San Francisco, California, yeah. So hopefully more doctors get educated on this technology. Here's another crazy thing. It just came out in July. I got screened in September. Wow. Mm. So I'm just like... It was like a... um. It was like God's plan. Universe. For, yeah. Yeah, I really feel that so strongly because what made me want to go get a private doctor? You know how it is. We lived the fast life. Did you feel something though? Was something wrong? Or? Nah, nothing was wrong. Nothing at all. So you didn't feel anything off? He was like, let me just go whatever, whatever. I just started thinking like, I'm doing everything right. What am I not doing right right now? I should probably get someone to look after me. Right. Probably make sure my body's good. You know what I mean? Crazy. And the as private hell. doctor just said, "Hey, there's this new treatment, this new uh, thing where we can test for this. It's called Grail. Let's just try it out." Yeah. Holy and, cow. And that's scary. So how do how do you move differently after that now? Because are, are, have you made some lifestyle changes? Are there things like you said you are very successful right mm-hmm. now? So are there things you're like, okay, I got to live like this? Well, three things. First thing is like doing everything you always wanted to do. Because now you know, you know, no, knowing you have cancer is the hardest part about it. Because that word is just so scary, right? So the first thing I started doing was. Everything I always wanted to do. And getting that off, right? And then pre-surgery, I had to go into like intermittent fasting, like fruits and vegetables only. No rice, no meat, no nothing. Mm-hmm. It was tough. But then after surgery, because they messed with my colon, removed you know a lot of my colon, I could only do solid foods. Now going back into chemo, I'm going to have to change my diet again. So it's a, it's a trip. It's all learning experience. But I just feel so blessed I caught that. Because they told me another six months without addressing it, I'd be dead. Wow. Wow. Straight up. And, and you know, I see things like what just happened to Virgil, rest in peace to him. That shit hits different because mm-hmm. look how young he was, 41. 41. Mm-hmm. Right? So. And he found out like two years ago. Mm-hmm. And that's how quickly. Yeah, because if, if you don't catch it right in time, that, that, that thing is just going to do its, its thing to your body. It's crazy. It's like. And especially during COVID right now, too. Well, that's another that thing. So a lot of people during COVID were not really paying attention to their body or any symptoms because they were scared to go to the doctor or yeah, hospital. They tell you don't go to the hospital unless you have to. And also the doctors and hospitals are short-staffed and whatnot. So weird time for us. Absolutely. So you, you when you recorded this album, you were recording this album like this might be your last. 100%. 
Like that's the first, when I got the call, the first thing I did was like, <clears throat> well, I was blown away. I was like, oh, no way, right? And I was like, all right, cool. Picked up the phone, called my best friend Cosmo, told him, mm-hmm. man, book the studio and you gotta go crazy. Like, I want you to have, you have no budget for production. Like, just go crazy, let's have fun with this. Cause I literally recorded um, all the way up until the day before surgery. I didn't go home, I couldn't look at my kids, I couldn't look at the wife, I couldn't look at the dogs. I'm like, yo, this is, cause it's a roller coaster. You find out you have cancer through blood, right? And then you go to do a colonoscopy and they find out if they can remove what they found and they tell you they can't. Then you go do a CT scan and see if it spreads and then it didn't. Then you plan a surgery, and then after surgery, it's a biopsy, and then you have to wait to see what the next move is. So we're talking about a month of a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm not just gonna sit at home and be feeling sorry for myself. I'm about to go knock out the best album I possibly can Mm -hmm. and do some bucket list shit, you know? Man, and you started it off with Future draped up. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, no, I mean, that was like, uh, that's what put us into like real album mode, because I I just cut the verse to that, and I was like, you know who sound crazy on this Future? I made a couple phone calls, got him on the phone. He's about his he's about his business. He made that happen the same day and, and I just turned up like the morale for the album. Then I started trying to put together, you know, timeless records. Now of course you're in the marijuana business. What did they say as far as marijuana and, and the cancer that you had? So when I called, um I just dropped a documentary called Mind Over Matter and it was just show like the whole process of me talking to my doctors doing the music and so when I was talking to her she was like, yeah, you can't smoke for a week after your surgery. I, or she said, you can't smoke after the surgery. I said, oh, no, that's going to be a problem. Smoke, she means smoke forever? No, just like for a while. Because, okay. you know, the inside wounds need to heal. Mm-hmm. And I said, ma'am, I need you to be honest with me. I need that shit for the soul. Like, how long? She was like, at least wait a week. I waited four days, and I called my doctor. I said, Dr. J, for the soul, I need to hit the weed right now. Because it's painful, man. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, You can't do I, an edible? I can't handle edibles. Bernard said he don't do edibles. I, I know, but it. I'm just saying, at a time like this, when you're yeah. like, okay, the smoke is not good for but you. But you know what? Like, I feel like if I would have done edibles, I might have been starting to trip off how my body felt. Because edibles, you really feel it in your body. Mm-hmm. So if I start feeling something weird, I might have had a panic attack or something. You can't but... do, like, micro-dosing, though? Like a... Yeah, you can. I'm a stubborn flower smoker, though. Like, I have to <laughs> hit the weed. Like, I have to hit the weed. And so when I called him, he said, Burn, it's only been four days. I said, Doc... Please. He said, all right, go ahead, blast off. I said, for sure. At least you were honest with your doctor. A lot of people are not honest with their doctors, and I yeah. never understand why. Like, he's protecting you. He, he started... saved my life. Yeah. Straight up. So, I'm, you know, I'm going to listen to what he has to say for sure. Then and you I... couldn't even not smoke for a week, though? Four days. I went four days. <laughs> yeah, come on, days. Burner. Like, F that. This is your life we're days. talking about. I know. A, it was so week. tough. It was tough being in the hospital because you realize, like, <laughs> no matter how popping you are, no matter, no matter how much bread you got, you're just another naked man on that hospital floor when you're in there. And that shit was tough. It was like a humbling ass experience for your boy. You know what I mean? I was gonna ask you, before we get to the album, now when you did Back to Marijuana, your your, your brand, it seems like it's increased like crazy. Mm-hmm. Like International pro- now. Internationally. Yeah. Um. So do you sell it to all these dispensaries? Or is it one of these things where they're bootlegging your brand now? Because Nah, it's- nah, so I mean, you know, what we do is we set up cultivation partners in every state and country. I mean, we're in some countries that are blowing my mind right now, you know. So we we find the right partner, and uh, we give them the menu to cultivate, and we just we embrace what they're doing really well already without us and turn them up all the way to the max. So now the dispensaries you see with cookies, it's all real. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, we got 43 stores right now. Shout out to Hardeen. Hardeen uh, sends me my package each and every Yeah, they got they got real cookies. And yeah, they even got uh, edibles too. Yeah. What's, what's the your, most what's profitable on? one out of all of the cookie stores? I think um, it'd have to be, uh, would be between 8 Mile in, in Michigan, mm-hmm. Las Vegas Strip, or Cookies on Melrose. And Mary Speak- Jane and... and- Mary Jean out in Detroit too. They they they're pretty big with it. I got I got speaking of Bud, I got some gifts for you. I know I know you like to partake. <laughs> you heard about that? And then someone's got to bust down Charlemagne's bag because he oh, well, he's not, not here. here. We'll share it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If it's not here, you know. Sorry, sorry, oh Charlemagne. I know last time he was on me, but amazing. That's going well, to he should have been here, man. That's for her. <laughs> thank you, thank, yeah. thank you so much. Now, I was gonna ask. So now let's talk about this album, Gotti. Um, I spoke to you over the phone and you told me the history and and how the the album came together. So. Break down why you called it Gotti and how you can use uh, Gotti's name for your album. But not even just his name, but you also have audio. Yeah, I'm yeah, release trial. audio. Break yeah. that down. Yeah, it made it so special. I mean, I do my album, so I got 43 albums out right now. 
maybe 44. And I do kind of like trilogies, like themes. And so I did uh, Russ Buffalino, I have Polly Cicero, and I wanted to end the Mafia trilogy as hard as possible. Like, what's the best way I could do that? I was like, well, I kind of felt like the world was coming at me. I got to call this album Gotti. So I made a couple phone calls. Um, and while I was in the studio dealing with all this stuff, I got a call like, yo, you got to fight in New York on Friday. And I was like, like this Friday? He's like, yeah, you sit down with John Jr. I'm like, oh, shit. I looked at my thing. I'm like, only two-day notice? All right, let's go. So how did, first of all, how'd you get in touch with John Gotti's son? I just made I just made some calls. And the junior, he's he's what? He's like 40-something, right? Yeah, yeah. He's in his 40s. Yeah, late okay. 40s. So you were trying to clear the name Gotti, and that's yeah. why you were reaching out, just to let him mm -hmm. know, listen, this is what I want to call. I went to school yeah. with him. He was a senior when I was a freshman. You did? But, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I pulled up on him, and we spent about 14 hours together. We just talked, and he was he was very honest with me uh, straight up. Like, I, you want to use my father's name and image for this album? Like, I don't even really listen. I don't even listen to rap at all, and, you know, and I don't really know what you're about, but I'll do some homework. And through after, you know, hours and hours of chilling, we started bonding. He was cool as hell. Like he's I picked a, it to an Italian restaurant. Yeah, yeah so I mean. Zeppelis and pasta. Just like super, super, super cool experience. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, after doing some research, he came back and said, yo, my family knows who you are. Everyone actually knows who you are except me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, I got some great feedback on who you are, and uh, I'm going to come out to L.A. and see you while you're working on the album. Maybe I could bring some unreleased audio of my father. I'm like, oh, Sheesh. shit. I'm like, okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. um, so he pulled up to L.A., popped in some tapes. Um, this was all stuff that the feds recorded of his father. Mm. And he actually ended up subpoenaing the fe uh, sending the feds a subpoena to get these audios to prove his innocence when he was fighting a... Uh, they were trying to give my boy the death sentence. Mm. Um, John Gotti Jr. beat five Rico acts. He's probably one of the best when it comes to like his defense team. So he got these tapes back. And so the fact he let me use these with the album and um, it just made everything so much. That turned up everything so much more. That's when I was like, all right, now we're really in the album mode. We got the blessing from the family. You know, I got the weight of like the legacy on my shoulder. Like, mm -hmm. let's just go crazy. Wow. So now, how, how I was talking to the son? Was the son cool? Did it give you? Did it give you like mafia vibes and, and extremely did it make you nervous at all? Nah, he's such a gentleman, mm -hmm. man. Um, but extremely mafia vibes. You know, uh, just manners, characteristic, respect, man of his word, very precise. Like there was no like everything he said he was gonna do, he did above and beyond. I'm actually gonna go have dinner with him tonight. Nice. I mean, him and the whole family. I mean, he's he's gonna be my friend for life. He's called me and checked on me about my cancer situation more than some of my partners have. That's you know? great. So, now I got a, a good friend. Now too is, many goats. Which, yeah. Rick too Ross, goats. Nas, Jadakiss. And they were talking some great entrepreneur stuff on there, too, yeah. which I like. So, so let's talk about that. How did that record come together? So, you know, going back to just trying to do things I've always wanted to do, um, as well as do shit that people can't really pull off. Like, I've been doing music for a long time. I think I'm a great A&R when it comes to putting records together. I got a good ear for music. And so I sent it to Rosé first. Um, he knocked it out. He came right after me. I was like, mm, I got studio itis. So when I hear something a certain way, I can't change it. I'm like, okay, it's not, now me and Rose are back to back. I need a hook. Reach out to a couple of people. Kevin Cossum did the hook. Nas was in the studio next to me. Mm -hmm. You know, send a little bird uh, that way, a little, you know, just kind of put it in his ear. I want to get him on the album. Um, and then Jada Kiss pulled up, you know, to my session with the locks. Wish me well. That's a big homie. Mm -hmm. um, he ended up dropping his verse, and then Nas sent his vocals in. So it just came together crazy. That's not easy to um, get a Nas verse. No, it's not. <laughs> and and it's not easy to put all those people on one record and have it sound that good. And I was actually about to change my verse on it because everyone <laughs> came so crazy. But mm -hmm. Nas gave me super compliments on my on my verse. And then just yesterday, J Kiss was like, "Man, like I really listened to what you said." And you know, rappers these days only have like two or three real bars. Like mm -hmm. everything you say is facts. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm keeping that shit then. So I try to send it to Funk Flex, man. I want to hear the bomb drop while I'm in New York. That's mm -hmm. the last icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. I really want to just hear that while I'm here. So mm -hmm. hopefully he fucks with it. Okay. Now you also have this song, First 48. It feels like you were talking about somebody specific or in particular. Uh, <laughs> or a lot of different people. You know, just people telling themselves on the internet. You know, I always joke about like, man, I don't even have to watch First 48 anymore. You go to Instagram, people are just lining up real cases. I mean, the, Instagram is the single biggest source of information for the feds and for, you know, law enforcement to, to rile up cases on people. And so I felt like, man, what the fuck are y'all doing? 
right. what, what is people really doing right now telling on themselves like and this? when you really have it too it's not like the best idea to be flossing like that I, mm-hmm. I wear this you know when I have to wear it but I really am a low key guy I don't really you know and I never showed a bunch of money on the internet you can't do that mm-hmm. I mean besides telling on yourself you're gonna have people running up in your home and stuff like that so first 48 for me it was just kind of like man it's, what's really going on because people get blindsided by the internet and they just want to show off so much and it's probably not the right thing for for them but let alone their whole crew you know yeah, we've seen some crazy things happening Whole we lot. were just talking about um earlier how now uh debt collectors can actually contact you on social media man so. i wouldn't even <laughs> doubt it i mean social media has been became crazy and it's mm-hmm. just it's nuts people don't really think about what they're posting when they post it i was going to ask you you know with back to the weed business you know, a lot a lot of times now you're seeing that people are, are smoking weed or, or buying drugs laced with fentanyl. Mm. You want to talk about that a little bit? How can somebody tell? Is there a way to tell? Because, you know... You know, with weed, I don't know, but I, I really super fuck with the cartel's message they put out recently from Mexico. The they cartel? Said, the drug cartel? The drug cartel said, if we find out who the hell is lacing all this shit with fentanyl, we're going to kill you and your whole family because... It's being done on purpose. This is not like something that's just happening randomly. People are not like, let me lace this pack with fentanyl. Like someone's doing it on purpose, right? And so when the cartels came out with that, I mean, I don't really promote violence or nothing like that, but people are dying from fentanyl, a lot of people, you know? Um, so as far as the weed goes, I don't know. I would just say buy your shit from a store. You can't really trust street weed, you know? Right. You know, they just opened up um, some testing sites in New York where you can actually go and get your drugs tested oh, to make sure, yeah, they. I think because it is such a, um epidemic now, they've done that. Some people are objecting to it because they don't want that in their neighborhood where there's people who use drugs that are going to get their drugs tested to make sure. We don't sure. want to get like caught up, like bring a bag of coke over there or something. They're like, oh, yeah, handcuff Everybody bring something. coke to the no, neighborhood. They, check this coke. But when they do that, you're not allowed to arrest people. Like you're going there to get it tested so you don't die because it's more about protecting people then um because you you know what they're more concerned is the people who are dealing mm. than the people who are buying right. i don't think any dealers are putting fentanyl on their product on purpose i right. think that like there's a some kind of something you know i don't know i don't want to get into conspiracy because mm-hmm. we can go deep but someone someone is doing that like there's a group or some kind of organization doing that and i think that people are pretty pissed because come on you, now you you also own all your masters all my masters yeah now, why did you not decide to sign to a major and continue independent? Because I see, this is the sad thing. I see so many artists, um, re- even recently, talking about they don't make any money off their music. I see artists talking about um, they can't control whether, whether they drop something or not. Like I said, I have over 40 albums, maybe 43, 46. For me, music is therapy. It's like a journal. So how could I not drop it when I want to drop it? And and honestly, if I decide to put down cookies today or stop doing anything else, I could live off my music, which is I make a lot of money off music, like a lot, like just from the digital side of things and shows. You know what I mean? I I get paid a lot of money for music. And so I just I felt like why sign to someone? Someone reached out to me recently about it when they started seeing all the momentum for Gotti. I'm like, but well, why would I do that? I got hella money. I got money. I got the contacts, the respect. I have the knowledge of putting together a project. You know, I hit you myself. Mm hmm. Called you, damned you, like yo. The I'm, marijuana business is more profitable than music, though, is it? Mm, or no, it will be for sure. Yeah, when I sell cookies, yeah, for sure. But music is bankable revenue for me. Mm-hmm. You know, like with mm-hmm. the with the cannabis business, you can't bank that bread. Okay. You have to like play chess and move it around, and like it's crazy, and it's such a gray area because it's not federally legal yet, but. Mm-hmm. The iTunes check hit that bank every month. I could pay my mortgage <laughs> and I could go do this and do that and, you know, swipe the cards. So I love music. You know what I, I mean? I was going to ask you, you know, first of all, have you been arrested for marijuana before? I've never been arrested for anything. Is it is it weird to you that they used to give you all this flack, but now it's so legal and so many people are doing it? And if you go to Jersey, gas stations sell it now. Well, they I don't heard sell that. weed. What they do is, like, they sell, uh, you know, a pen for thirty dollars and then give you a free bag of weed. Mm-hmm. That's what they do. But th- does that does that make you like this is wild? I love it, and that's why earlier when we were talking, I said I love coming out here because I always told myself if I cause the first time I came here, I invented a mini vacuum sealer for my press run so I could vacuum seal my weed because I was scared of these big buildings. I didn't want them, but he got weed. Arrest his ass. Now, so the difference <laughs> now. <laughs> I'm like, if I was telling myself, if I could smoke weed in New York, I'd be there all the time. I'm probably going to buy a brownstone out here and just relax when I want to come relax because I love smoking weed in the streets and I love seeing how fired up the people are. I went to um, Luigi's yesterday in Park Slope mm-hmm. to go grab a slice. I wanted to try that place really bad. And 
I gave the guy a bag of bud, and he was so fired up, man. He was so happy, and he was like, I've been doing this for years, you know, but I just, I, now I feel like I can finally, like, you I'm know, out. not be scared. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, man, OG, look, I'll trade you flavors any day, man. Keep them slices coming. I'll give you some bud. So it's just cool seeing the city embrace the bud. You, you know, know what's scary, though, is the people who are getting licenses in New York as they're trying to figure out what the regulations are going to be is mm-hmm. harder for us to be able to get access to that. It's going to be tough, and hopefully, like, some of the original players, like, I've been to a couple pop-ups um, while I've been out here. Shout out to Smokers Club. Shout out to Astros Club. It's really cool to pop up and, like, be able to buy a butt and smoke and vibe and chill. So hopefully some of these, you know, true players get licenses out here. Yeah, because they're having dinner parties now where it's, like, the food is cooked with, um... With weed. Yeah, with weed. Like, come uh-huh. through. We're having pizza parties and everything. Well, I'm, I'm coming to New York for sure. We're putting all our resources into bringing cookies to New York. But what we're going to do is, like, the first person I partner with in NY was Branson. Branson, mm-hmm. shout out to Branson. You know, like, I, I didn't want to come out here and go right to the rappers or anything like that. Shout out to all my brothers that have been asking me to do things. But Branson's been an OG for a long time. So Absolutely. that was that was the first person I wanted to do a deal with. Like, let's get them triangle bags all through the city again and have you feel comfortable about doing that. So we've been bringing him around and showing him, like, what the what the rec game looks like. And he's blown, his mind's blown from it. Well, let's let's get into it. We appreciate oh, wait, you. Wait, last honest. thing, bucket list. All right, because you talked about that earlier, and it's a song on the album. Mm-hmm. So what were some things on your bucket list that you had to accomplish? Well, I definitely want to take my I definitely want to take my kid to Spain and, and out here to New York. I told my daughter we're going to start traveling soon. Dope. And she's an entrepreneur too, right? Yeah, she's an entrepreneur for sure. I'm just teaching her about life. Um, I think some of the lineups on these records was bucket list. I think doing an album like Gotti, where I actually really rolled it out and put respect on it, was bucket list. and. Mm-hmm. Doing a record with Pockets Bucket List, and you know, there's is that record on the on the album? Nah, it's 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 happening probably for the deluxe. Okay, cause yeah. I heard that you had a Pock on it, so I looked, I listened to the album, and I didn't hear it. I was like, well, maybe he didn't put it out yet, or maybe he couldn't yeah. get clearance or something. You know, now the estate has been super cool about it, and we've just been going back and forth. We're trying to find something that would fit like my kind of style, you know, just with what I'm talking about. So. You know, hey, God willing, it will happen. But if that happens, that's the ultimate life goal right there. So that how'd you be, get a Pock verse? I just reached out to the estate. And just had a conversation. We're still in conversation, so you know, fingers crossed, it's not there yet. But you're really good at just reaching out to people. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I got it from my mom. You got to be a good conversationalist. You That's have to be good. able to talk. Some people have... have too much ego to want yeah, to do that. No. Though Burner reaches out to ev- anything that I, I've never met Burner's team. I always talk to Burner directly. That's yeah. a great yeah. thing because it makes people want to do things absolutely. with you more. You have to be hands on because if you're not hands on, you'll be misrepresented. So I, re- when I reached out to the state, I said, "Well, first of all, this would be a life goal to, if we could figure it out. If it's even possible. Mm-hmm. If it's possible, then let's figure out how we can get it done and." Let's, let's hear some records, and I told him how I'd go about it and why I wanted to do it. But here's the crazy thing, and this is why I wanted the Pac first. Mm-hmm. When John Jr. sent over the audio of, of Gotti, the first thing he said was like, you know Machiavelli, he always said, well, you know, what do you respect more, love or fear? And it's fear. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> and there's a there's a story where Pac was with the Gottis in, in jail. I know he was with them in jail, mm-hmm. right? And then there's also, uh, the, the state told me there's a rumor that he went and had dinner with them while in New York and got the fresh made pot. So it just, uh, it was already kind of there. Like it just kind of like fit. So mm-hmm. when I heard that Machiavelli, I was like, I'm saving this Gotti intro right here and hopefully Pac's going to go there. And the one thing I've learned in my life and I always, people always say, you know, follow your dreams. I think it's deeper than I think that you can manifest certain things. I really feel like if you really believe in certain things and you just keep pushing your mind, I think that shit could happen. So you have the Tupac verse already or you're waiting? Not yet. I'm waiting for it. I'm actually supposed to hear a couple options when I leave here today. Ooh. Oh, fire, right? That's why you love New York. You got a lot going on while you're here. Okay. A lot a lot going on. Well, talking to your record right now, what record do you want to hear? Let's hear Too Many Ghosts. Introduce Please. It. Yeah, no, nah, this is Too Many Ghosts, produced by my brother Cosmo, featuring Rick Ross, Nas, and Jadakiss, as well as Kevin Cossum, and I think it's a star-studded record. All right. Well, Burner, we appreciate you for joining us, and thank for the goodies. We appreciate this, yeah. too. Yeah, no yeah, man. smoke that up, man. That's some Bernie <laughs> Hanna butter right there. All right. It's the Breakfast Club. It's Burner! Thank you.